Hello everyone and welcome back. We've reached the end of HTML level 2, so we'll have an assessment. For this assessment, you're just going to be recreating the front end of a basic sign-up page for some sort of online course website. So check out the file HTML level 2 assessment.html. Just copy that full file path and put it into your browser. Try not to actually look at the HTML. And let's explore it before you begin because it's what you're going to be recreating for your assessment. Alright, so here I have the file and I've zoomed in a bit so we can see it clearly. We have a heading here, course signup page, and then it also says, please note, first name, last name, password, and email are required. So you're going to have to make sure that those fields are have some sort of way of being required when you click submit. Review the lectures if you don't remember how to do that. And you'll notice that this first name, last name, and email also have some placeholders. So I see something here that says first name, and I type, and it goes away. And then we also have password. Make sure that if you type something into password, it's hidden from view. Then we say, are you over the age of 18? And we have two radio buttons. Note that as I click yes and no, it changes. So that means they're linked somehow. And then finally, we have this, do you have a credit card or PayPal? And we have a drop down menu that says either choose credit card or PayPal. Another way you could have interpreted this question is, do you have a credit card or PayPal? Yes or no. Um, really, I just care that you remember how to do a drop down menu. And then you can click sign up. And basically, well, I need to fill this out. So let's do that at gmail.com some password, sign up, and nothing should happen. It just basically refreshes to, in my case, the non-zoomed in version. But you can see up here in the URL that this has changed. All right, as a bonus, if you feel that this is pretty easy, what I want you to do is see if you can select an action to actually connect this form to some other HTML page that you've written, maybe a thank you page. So when you click sign up, See if you can link it to a thank you page as a bonus through an action. All right, best of luck, and I will see you at the next lecture where we actually code through this. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the solutions lecture for the HTML level two assessment. Let's get started by jumping straight to the editor. All right, so here I have the editor and the course signup page opened. I'm just going to start straight from scratch, but remember this is what we're trying to recreate here with HTML. So the first thing we want to do is just call HTML, give this some sort of title, we'll just say course sign up, and then let's start off with the body. So here we can see there's some sort of heading one, and we will say course sign up page to match that. And then we have what appears to be a paragraph, you could have done heading two or heading three, that's fine. And we'll say, please note, we'll say all text fields required just to save us some time. And then we start with the real business, which is the form. So I'll call the form right now and we will remove class action and post. There was a bonus uh, on the action, which we'll cover in just a little bit towards the end. But let's start off with the basic form. First thing you wanted to do is the inputs. So we have a first name input and a last name input. Let's grab those inputs. The first name is just a text input. It has no value, but it does have a placeholder. So let's put that in here. We'll put a placeholder in that says first name. And then let's just label this. We'll give it a label and we'll say it's for FM for first name. And we'll give the input an ID of FM. And then let's come back up here and give it the label first name colon. All right, and we're going to do a very similar thing for the last name. So let's do that as well. Let's copy this and paste it. Let's make this last name. Let's come up here and change this to LM for last name. It looks like I accidentally wrote M instead of N. So let's change those on both of these LN and FN, it's first name, last name. And then the placeholder here, instead of first name, it's going to say last name. All right, so, so far we have an extra T there. So far we have the first two inputs for the first name and the last name. Let's save this and make sure we're connected, make sure everything's working correctly. So I will delete that, hit enter, and it looks like we're good to go here. We have the course signup page, all the text fields are required, first name and last name. So something to remember is that they're all required, which means I need to add one more parameter here in my input, which is just the 
required keyword. And I need to do the same thing here, required. And you can see that Adam is already ready to help me out. And you just need to, you could say it equals to true, but that's all I really need here. Okay, then up next, we want the email that we had earlier. So again, I will say input. This time I'll say email and I will give the placeholder. And let's just say the placeholder is user at gmail.com or something like that. Can't remember quite what it was, but we'll put in a label here and we'll say this label is for e, let's say email or let's call it mail. So we don't confuse it with the type and give it an ID of mail. And then for the label, we will say email. And then finally, we also want a password. So again, I will make a label here. We'll say it's for pass. We'll call password there and then create the input for it. Input, and you'll notice it's, it, this becomes a lot faster when you're using uh, Adam's really helpful auto complete. So we will say password and no placeholder there. Let's save this and see what it looks like so far. And we're probably gonna have to change something. Note that we have a bit of a, basically no gap between first name, last name, email, and password. So one quick fix we can do that, since we don't know styling yet, is to just in between first name and last name, add some paragraph tags to insert another block there, and we can just keep them blank. So now when I refresh this, we get a little empty block there. Later on when we learn about CSS, we're gonna learn how we can actually call styling for buffers and margins, etc. But right now we can just use this little cheat. Okay, so we have all the text fields and let's make sure we have them all required. So we still need to add those to the last two we just created. So required. And then down here, we also wanna add in required. And you don't need to say equals in our case, we just can just say required there. Then up next, we want to get if some radio buttons to ask if we're over the age of 18, yes or no. So let's put a paragraph in here saying, are you over 18, question mark. We'll need two inputs and they're both gonna be radio. It's going to be an input, we'll call it radio. And remember, if we want them to be linked, they need to share the same name. So we'll call them both over asking if they're over 18. And let's give them a label. So we'll say label for Y is yes. And then give the first one an ID of Y. And then so we can recognize it later, let's give it a value of yes. And let's give this one a value of no and give it a label. And the reason for that is later on, whatever they select, I can reference the value there. So we'll put in a label here for n, give it an ID equal to n. And then here it's going to be no. So let's save that. Make sure everything's working correctly for us. Are you over 18? Let's make sure they're linked together. And it looks like that's working just fine. All right, we can even expand this a little bit. And now let's check out the last thing we needed to do, which was a drop down. Do you have a credit card or PayPal? So let's just say you have a card or PayPal, question mark. And remember the drop down doesn't use an input tag, instead it uses a select tag. So we have select, we can give it a class, but we don't worry about that. We can also give it a name. Let's just give it a simple name. We'll say payment. And then finally, inside of this, we have the option tags. So option one, we'll say this is a value of CC and we'll give it the actual name on the HTML credit card, or excuse me, not really a name, but what it's actually going to display. And then the next option value here, we'll say PP for PayPal <laughs> and then PayPal there. So let's save that, make sure it's working when I refresh this. Do you have a credit card or PayPal? And here we can select them, perfect. And when I actually click submit, I'll get back a value either CC or uh, PP for payment. Okie dokes. Finally, let's use that paragraph trick again and input the submit button. So input, submit, 
and the value we'll give it is sign up. And let's save this. And let's confirm that it all worked. We'll refresh this. We'll put in a first name, put in a last name, put in some email. It's just made up. And then some password over 18, credit card, sign up. It should just basically refresh the page. And if we look over here on the URL, if I expand this, I see the options that I wanted. Perfect. All right. So what we can do now is to expand on this, you could add values. So you could give password a value and email a value if you want them to show up here in the URL after clicking submit. But that doesn't help us too much right now because we don't know how to use stuff on the back end to actually grab those values. So we'll leave it there for now. What I want to address is the actual bonus question, which was how can you make this sign up link to another page or another HTML file? And remember, we can do that through an action. So I will call action here. And what I will do is I will create, if I bring back my directory with control or command backslash, I'll create a new file here and we'll say thank you .html. And here it's just going to be an HTML file with one heading saying thank you. We will save that. And then the action is going to take us to that thank you .html. And the method will be get. Save that. So it looks really similar to what we showed earlier when we actually linked it to the Facebook page, but instead now the action is linking to a local HTML. And make sure it's in the same directory that we don't have to pass in the whole file path. You just pass in thank you.html. So I will save that, refresh this, and let me make sure I refresh that correctly. Hit enter. Okay, course sign up page. Let's zoom out a little bit so it's still okay. I'll put in the same information as last time, Portia, some made up email address, made up password, over 18, credit card, sign up, and it takes us to the thank you page. Hopefully you're able to figure out that bonus as well. But what I really want you to see is now we're actually ready to almost level up to understanding how we can link pages together. And that's gonna be a really big part of creating a web application, how pages link to each other, um, and how your whole web application is designed to interact within itself. All right, so let's just quickly review everything we just did by grabbing this guy and expanding it. So what we had to do is we created that heading one, just a paragraph. We had the form, and if you did the bonus, you wanted to select action and method to some other HTML page you had, or if you wanted to uh, just another website. Remember for the website, you need to pass in HTTPS, etc. Otherwise, it'll start looking in the local namespace which means on your computer. Then we wanted to use labels. We had the input for these texts. Remember, we had to make sure they were all required. We had the first name, last name, have the placeholders, make sure they're required. This little trick for the paragraph, don't worry if you didn't get that yet. Uh, you won't need it later on when we actually learn about CSS. So if you were having difficulty with that, uh, don't sweat it. It's kind of a trick. Then coming up next, we had to have this email label, password. Again, it was required. Are you over 18? Big trick here is when you're dealing with radio buttons and you want them to be linked together, make sure they have the same name. In this case, it was over and over. And assigning values to the text fields wasn't really necessary for our use case, but obviously you will have to assign values to them when we're dealing with a full web application. So keep that in mind. Then finally, we had this drop down menu of card or PayPal, and that's the select tag with the option tag. And then we had the submit button. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that assessment exercise, and you basically know enough HTML now to continue on with the rest of the course. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next section. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part five, forms and labels. We've already explored the basic input tags, things such as email types, uh, password types, and we even saw some more fun ones such as the color type of inputs. But now what we want to do is really understand how to connect these various input tags to two features. And one is an action upon clicking that submit button. And another one is actually labeling that input. The use of that label tag will allow you to add labels in front of an input in your HTML form. And we're going to be learning how to use the label as well as, well as the four parameter inside of that label tag. And then we're also going to exploring how to activate actions upon clicking the submit button. What we're going to do is walk through a couple of examples that 
further explain things that we didn't cover last time but did see last time. So if, if you remember from the previous lecture, when I clicked that submit button, it seemed to just refresh the page and not really do anything. And we also saw that when we created a form tag, we had that action and method key parameters that we didn't really define or talk about. Now is the time to revisit those topics and see how they really work. Let's jump to the text editor to get started. All right, so here I am at the editor, and I also have the forms.html file open. Let's start off by recreating just a very simple form, and I will use the form tag. And notice we have that class, action, and method parameters. Right now, we're just going to ignore those and close them up, pass in input, hit enter, and then we'll say this input is just an email, and then we'll also give another input for submit. So that's the submit type of input. Something I will do, however, is add a name to this email. So last time we did this, but didn't actually really explore what happens when we add a name. So let's add a name, refresh this page, and let's add a couple more things here. I will say paragraph to enter email, and then give a value to this submit button. So we see something there. So we'll say submit, save that, refresh this, and now we see something that says enter email and submit. Let's see what happens when I actually enter an email and click submit. So I will say something like user at gmail.com. Hit submit. And notice it seems to essentially just refresh the page, but pay attention to what actually happened here in my URL. In my URL, now I see at the very end, user email is equal to user percent sign 40 gmail.com. And basically percent sign 40 is a code for the at symbol. And we now can see that when I click submit, I'm basically assigning whatever input I had there to that name. Let's try this again. I will call this HTML. And instead of entering email, I'm going to try just with a very basic text input. So I will say type, let's say enter here text. I will say type is equal to text and then give this name something like user input. We'll save this, refresh, and now I see enter text. Let's say enter text, and I will type in my stuff here, click submit, and we see now in the URL, we see forms.html with user input is equal to my stuff. So we can get, begin to get this idea that when I click submit, I'm actually assigning whatever is inputted to the name that the input tag had. Now what I want to do is explore the idea of an action occurring when I hit the submit button. So far right now when I hit submit, it basically just refreshes the page. Let's see if we can perform an action to go to another web page or another website upon clicking that submit button. So we come back here to form and put an action in. And then we can pass in a web page. Now a lot of times you won't be passing in another website, you'd pass in another web page within your own web application. But right now, since we don't have a full backend, we'll just say the action is equal to HTTP, and we can say HTTPS, www. let's say facebook.com. And then we need to also supply the method, and we'll say it's a get value method. We're going to be talking a lot more about method and get versus post in future lectures, but right now let's just keep it simple by saying Upon clicking the submit button, the action I want you to do is go ahead and go to facebook.com and we'll see that we still retain that user input. So let me call HTML again or forms.html. Here we see enter text and let's just make sure that's working by saying enter text and take me to FB for Facebook. And we'll refresh this and now we see enter text and take me to FB. So I will enter some text here. So we'll say hello world, hit submit, and let's see what happens. Now it takes me to HTTPS Facebook.com with the user input equal to hello world. So we can begin to get this idea that upon clicking that submit button, I can call actions to take me to other web pages within my entire web application along with the actual input. So what might be nice is upon clicking submit, it actually takes me to that user profiles page based off what they inputted in these input tags. All right, 
Now we don't know enough about the back end to actually handle a lot of this stuff. Right now we're basically just working all of this on the front end, but hopefully it's pretty impressive what just pure HTML can do by itself. Let's go back here to forms and then finally talk about labels. Labels is going to be uh, just a very quick topic on this. So I will delete this and go back to a normal form, click save, and then show something very simple. Something like enter some text and then in this input I'm just going to be having it say text. We'll save this, refresh, and it says enter some text. So I can just say hello world, etc. Now something I want to notice here is that when I call this paragraph this input type text becomes a new block. So it's not on the same line as this paragraph. Something I may want to do is actually label all the text inputs on a form. So a form may have various inputs. It may have multiple text inputs. Maybe you're filling out a job application online and you have various text boxes to fill out. Something you may want to do is try to label them. And there's two ways of doing it. We'll show you the technically bad way of doing it, which is individual, and then we'll show you the way you should be doing it. So if I just type in label or begin to type it in, I get this label tag filled out with this for parameter. And we're going to discuss what that for parameter means in just a second. But right now we'll show you kind of the quote unquote bad way of doing it. It's basically just the more repeatable way. But the reason we don't want that is because we want to practice dry coding principles, dry standing for DRY or don't repeat yourself. So if I call this over here and paste it into that label, so here's my input type, and then I say enter text colon, save this, and now refresh that form page, I can see now that the label is on the same code block as the actual input, and that's what I wanted. But now let's say I have multiple inputs. Something I may have to do now is just keep calling labels, so I'll say Something like, again, enter text, call the input type, and text. And let's give these values. We'll say this is block one, just so it's clear. We'll call this block two. Save that, refresh the page, and we can see here I say enter text, block one, enter text, block two. Something, however, that I don't want to do is constantly be repeating myself. So I don't want to have to actually call label, enter text, label, enter text, etc. That's where that for parameter comes into play. So we just showed how to use a label individually, but now let's show how to use a label with that for parameter. So I will again call label, and here I have the for parameter. And what I will do is match this up to a new parameter that we're going to learn about called ID. So we'll say this is for user input, and then say something like enter input. And notice that inside of these label tags, it's just the text. I haven't actually passed in the input tag yet. Then outside of this, I'm going to say input. We'll say this is type text and we'll give it a value, something like hello. And we'll also give it an ID. An ID is something we're going to be exploring a lot more when we talk about CSS in the next section. But for now, I just want to make sure that ID links up and matches the for. And basically what this is saying is it's saying, okay, this label is for the ID user input. And there is the actual label. And then we can see that the input has this ID user input, which means it's going to link this label to this input. So let's refresh this. Well, let's save it and then refresh this. And we can see here, enter input has been linked to this text box. And I didn't actually have to now put that input into this label. And this is just a bit of a nicer and more common way to see label being used. Right now it may not make a whole lot of sense because we haven't really covered ID yet and we haven't really covered how to connect an ID uh, to another file. But right now just consider the idea that ID is a possible parameter for uniquely identifying an HTML tag. And that whole concept is going to make a lot more sense. We want to uniquely style HTML tags based off some sort of ID. And that's how we're going to be finding them based off of this ID. All right. So, so far we covered forms, how to perform an action with a form, how to label an input, and then how to use label with the for parameter. 
The last thing I want to mention are two extra parameters you can put into an input. And that is instead of a value, you can use a placeholder. So notice when I use value, I actually have to manually delete what's already in there. A lot of times on the internet, instead of a value, you will see something called a placeholder. So let's save that and refresh the page. And we can see here we have a placeholder and it's a little more faint in the font color. And that's because when I click on this, it will basically immediately disappear as soon as I start typing something. So that's much more common to see when you're building a website that has a placeholder instead of a value. So you'll often see things such as uh, enter email or like enter email here if this was an email input. So I'll refresh this as enter email here. And as soon as I click this and start typing stuff, that placeholder goes away. Uh, that's a much better way of using stuff to actually be a placeholder instead of a value. And the last thing I want to show you is this required argument. So basically what happens is when you pass in required here, it doesn't require anything to say required equals, it's just required. And basically what that means is when you click submit something, you need to make sure that it has this. So let me show you an example of that. We will say enter text here. And let's add in some more input. So let's just to make it simple, we'll get rid of this label. And we will get rid of this ID. And we will have this text input, as well as another text input, and this will have a placeholder. And this will say not required. And then finally, we will have an input with a submit button. Submit. And we will give that the value, whoops, let's expand that again. We will give that the value just submit. And then this will have a placeholder saying required. As you may have guessed, basically when we click submit, we are required to have input in this second text box. So I will refresh this. We see not required and required. So if I just put stuff in required, so I say hello, and don't put anything in not required, click submit. I don't have any problems. The page just refreshes. But now let's try it again. I'll zoom back in. And we will, let's get rid of this little pop-up. We will put something in not required, so hello, but not put anything in the required. I hit submit, and notice it says, please fill out this field. And all of that is happening with your browser, this recognizing that, hey, this HTML says that this input is required, so you must put something in there before clicking the submit button, or I'll give you a warning. And that's the difference between something being required and not required. All right, I know we covered a lot in this lecture, so let's briefly talk about it one more time. We talked about forms, how we can state an action to link to another web page, and then we can say method equals to get to actually complete that action. Then we talked about labels, how you can use an individual label to actually label one of your inputs. And then finally, we talked about the use of the for parameter with label, as well as placeholders instead of values and the required parameter. Okay, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part six, form selections. In this lecture, we're going to continue exploring the variety of input methods for HTML forms. And those are gonna be things such as a single radio button, how to link multiple radio buttons, drop down menus, and then text area inputs. Coming up next after this lecture will be an assessment exercise so we can fully understand everything that has to do with HTML forms. And that will end our HTML sections of the course. But before we reach the next assessment, let's get some quick practice with these various input methods. All right, so here I have a normal HTML file open and it's linked to my browser. It's just called forms.html. And you can see here, I've set the title to hotel feedback. So we now know enough HTML that we can try to mimic more of a real world situation. For instance, let's say you've stayed in a hotel. Afterwards, they may send you an email to a link asking for some feedback. So we're gonna try to mimic what that feedback page would look like. And to do this, let's just start with a heading that says something like hotel feedback form. Save this, refresh over here. Looks like it's linked correctly. Great. Now let's start with our form. And if you just auto create form, it'll have class, action, method, etc. Right now we don't really need that. If you want, you can set method to just be get right now. 
As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be covering what get and post is much more in the future. Right now, you can just leave it as you see it here. First thing I want to do is understand how radio buttons work. So for instance, if you just type in input and in type instead of text, you pass in radio, you can save this, refresh, and you see a little radio button pop up here. And if I click it, I can see that it got filled in. But right now, if I try to click it again, uh, nothing changes. I can't click it on and off. It's just clicking once. So let's try to expand on this concept by actually asking a question here. So in a header or heading three, I'm going to say this. Are you from inside the US or outside the US? So maybe we have international travelers and we want to know do they come from the United States or outside the United States if this hotel is in the United States or somewhere internationally. And then we'll have an input as a radio button and we will label this radio button. And let's review how we can label using that for method. So I can say something like for in US and then give this particular radio button an ID of in, let's say in USA. So let's save that. And in this label, I'm gonna say something like inside. Save it, refresh. And here we see, are you from inside the US or outside the US? And right now I can just highlight the only option available inside and I can only highlight it on, I can't change anything about it. So let's make another one. We'll make another label. We'll call this for out USA and we will call this outside and then create another input. We'll make another radio button type and give it the ID to match that label, which in our case is out USA. We will save this, refresh, and now we see we have a hotel feedback form and we have two options, inside or outside. But right now we have a little bit of a problem. I can actually highlight inside, highlight outside, and that's it, that's all I can do right now. What I would really like to do is to link these two radio buttons together so that if I click inside, then outside cannot be selected. Or if I click outside, then inside cannot be selected. So I wanna be able to turn these on and off in respect to each other. And the way you do that is you give them the same name. And that's where this name comes into play. So let's give this first radio button a name, LOC for location. And let's give the second one the same name, LOC. Now let's save this, refresh, and we notice if I click inside, it's highlighted. If I click outside, inside becomes unhighlighted. So we can see now that they're linked because they share the same name. And that makes sense because given what we know about names and the assignment, we'll have to assign something to that name. And in this case, we can only assign uh, one of these two. So it'll either be inside or outside. And that's how you link radio buttons together. You just give them the same name. They can have different labels, but if you want to link them together, you just give them the same name. All right, let's start exploring another type of input here. And this one is going to be, let's say, we'll ask, how was your service? So how was your service? Save that, make sure it worked. All right, so how was your service? And let's actually make this header two instead of just the paragraph, so it kind of matches along with the other one. And let's make this other one header two, so it's not so big. So we'll say header two over here as well, H2. Save that, refresh over here. So are you from inside the US, outside, that's linked together. How was your service? For the service, what we're gonna do is explore a drop-down menu. And the way a drop-down menu works is not with the input tag, but with the select tag. And the select tag works like this. You say select, you can give it a class right now that doesn't make sense for us because we haven't learned about CSS. So we'll come back to that later and we can give it a name. So let's give this the name stars. So we want a drop down menu of how many stars. And what we can do is give an option. And then this option has a value. So let's give this the, a value of great. And in between these option tags is going to be an actual number. So we'll say three. Let's save this and see what this looks like so far. So here we have the drop down three. And so far that's it. 
So let's create a couple more options for this drop down menu, and then we can break down what value is. So I'm gonna make another value that just says, okay, that's two. And then let's make one more option. And we will say this is bad, and it was one star. So now if I save this, I have my select, which indicates a drop down menu. I've given a name to my select, and I have various options here with what happens in between the option tags is what's actually displayed to the user. But behind the scenes, they can have their own values. So let's refresh this. And now that we say, how is your service? I see this dropdown gives me three, two, or one that I can choose from. So let's add a submit button to this. So we can see what happens when I hit submit. So outside of this, but inside the form, I'm going to create a submit button and give it a value called submit. Save that and refresh. And now let's pay attention to what happens to the URL after I hit submit. I'll say I'm from inside the US and my service was two. So now that I've clicked submit, we see here in the URL that I have LOC is equal to, and right now it's actually blank. And then it says, and stars is equal to okay. So what I wanna do is back in these radio buttons, actually fill in a value here that corresponds to the radio button. So I will set the value for inside, for the inside radio button, and set the value here for outside. Let's save this and refresh. And let's actually delete these values here. Go back to the forums page, refresh this, and now let's try again. We'll say hotel feedback form. Are you from inside? We'll say we're from inside. How is the service? We'll give it one star. And notice here, now I have corresponding values in both the drop-down menu and the radio buttons. So if I click submit, now I can see here in the URL that my LOC, the name, is equal to the value inside, since I chose inside. And stars is equal to the value here, bad. And that's a really nice way that you can have your own value names on your back end, but show something else on the front end. So notice that the front end here especially for the drop-down menu was three, two, one, but on the back end, I had these set values. Great, okay, bad. What might be more realistic is if you actually set values on to numerical values, three, two, one, and then here the options are great, okay, bad. And then you can maybe take mathematical averages uh, behind the scenes, but we're gonna learn a lot more about back-end stuff later on in this course. But hopefully you get an idea now of what's possible. Finally, I wanna add one more type of input that we wanna check out, and that's the text area input. So I'm gonna put a paragraph here and we'll have a question that says something like any other feedback you wanna give as a paragraph. Well, let's actually make that a header too. That way it's the same size as everything else. And we so far have learned about the text input. In fact, it's the default. So if I click save here, refresh, I see any other feedback. But usually you don't want the user to just type everything in one single line. You want an actual box text area. So the way we can do that is instead of text, we can say text area. And that actually creates its own text area tag. So I will delete this and say text area. We can give that a name. So we can just use the default here, or we can say my text. And you give it a number of rows and a number of columns you want it to expand. So let's save this and now refresh and see here, now I have my text area. So, hello, this is my text area, and now we have multiple lines that so we can start typing stuff in. And we're gonna learn more about text areas right now because it's a little different than taking in a single value because you have whole blocks of text. But I just want you to be aware that you have a text area here at your disposal. All right, so that's it for the various types of inputs we wanted to cover here under form selections. Let's do a quick review. Let me expand this. We've covered how to do radio buttons. Remember that's just input and the type is radio. And if you wanna link radio buttons together, you make sure the group of radio buttons just has the same name. And you can assign values to them so that once you click submit, you can get those values back. Then for a drop down menu, you use the select tag with options. And you can then again assign values and the values don't have to match up what the user actually sees as their drop down options. And then finally, we learned about the text area which allows you to basically make a block for a text area. And if we come back here to the browser, we can see that we can actually kind of play around with this a little bit as far as how far down it can go. 
And then finally, we have the submit button that we've covered before. All right, coming up next is an assessment exercise, so you can get a lot of practice with everything we've covered in this section of the course. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.